Hey guys, today I'll show you a zombie horror TV series named Reality Z. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The drama begins with a man, Leo, and his girlfriend, pushing open the door of his mother's house to invite her to the movies. However, his mother, Anna, declines their offer to watch a horror film, probably not wanting to be a third wheel to her son. Disappointed, Leo leaves with his girlfriend. Once they're gone, Anna eagerly turns on the TV and dives into the latest hit variety show, Olympus, where reality TV stars live in a rural temple, embodying different Greek deities and share amusing anecdotes from their daily lives. Tonight is the monthly elimination night, where viewers vote off the least popular deity. Brandau, the show's producer, takes this night seriously and arrives early to prepare. However, his frustration mounts when an important supporting cast member is nowhere to be found. Upon receiving an angry call from Brandau, the actor nervously explains he's stuck in traffic but promises to arrive soon. Just as he ends the call, he witnesses a shocking scene, a blood-covered zombie gnawing on a corpse by the roadside. The good-natured driver, who stopped to help, is now frozen in fear as the zombie turns its gory maw toward him and snarls menacingly. Cut to before the show starts. Enthusiastic fans have already gathered at the studio gates, all rushing into the auditorium, showcasing the Brazilian public's love for the Olympus show. With only an hour left before airtime, the scriptwriter receives a sudden notice from the higher-ups. For unknown reasons, riots have broken out in various places across Brazil with numerous casualties. As a result, tonight's episode must be canceled. No joking matter. Brandau quickly turns on the news to see a congressman on TV, denying accusations of racism amidst disbelief and scorn from the crowd who insult him outright. The situation escalates quickly as the congressman retorts, only for chaos to erupt when a zombie emerges from the crowd, attacking bystanders and causing numerous injuries and deaths. Seeing the turmoil, the congressman makes a quick escape out the back door and onto the street, which is also in disarray. Police are shooting zombies, but their efforts can't keep up with the spreading infection. As the situation spirals out of control, the congressman hails a police car, tossing in a suitcase full of money and successfully gets in. He instructs the officer to head to the airport, desperate to leave this nightmarish place behind. The scene shifts back to the production studio where a production assistant, Nina, is introduced. Having graduated from a film and television university, Nina, who is formally trained, harbors the dream of becoming an actress. Yet, she finds herself doing odd jobs on The Olympus Show, a low-level staff member in the crew, enduring scolding and hardship as part of her daily routine. She is filled with complaints about her job, but her boyfriend often soothes her. The couple occasionally flirts in the office using their muscles, making their days somewhat bearable. As the stage lights come on and cheers fill the venue, it's clear that the show is about to begin. It seems that Brandau, in pursuit of ratings, has chosen to ignore the order to stop broadcasting. The flamboyant hostess makes her entrance, whipping the atmosphere into a frenzy. The program is broadcast smoothly. In the midst of an office rendezvous, Nina receives a last-minute task from the scriptwriter to go out and buy a pack of beetle nuts. Her boyfriend immediately offers to help and takes the car keys to set off on the errand. Simultaneously, the tardy supporting actor arrives on set, clutching a bloodied driver. The actor deserves an Oscar award for dedication, since the driver's blood is nearly drained, yet he wasn't taken to the hospital for treatment right away. Suddenly, the driver mutates, biting the supporting actor and an assistant. As Nina's boyfriend is about to get into the car, he sees the zombified assistant crazily gnawing at a corpse nearby. Terrified, he turns and runs for his shitty life toward the crowd. However, the audience, engrossed in the performance on stage, is oblivious to the approaching danger. Then, a zombified security guard enters the crowd, attacking the spectators. The infection spreads rapidly, and soon the set is overrun. Realizing the danger, the audience starts to flee, while the boyfriend, chased by zombies, runs straight into the broadcasting center. Exhausted, he falls and is instantly bitten by the zombies behind him. Witnessing this horrific scene, the other staff members panic like chickens and rush towards the exit as fast as broken Tesla bikes. Brandau is the first to run out, but selfishly, he locks the main door, trapping the scriptwriter and others inside, sending them straight to meet zombie Satan. Music blares on stage, oblivious to the tragedy unfolding as the actors playing deities prepare for their performance backstage, mistaking the distant shouts for the audience getting wild, unaware of the horror outside. 
Brandau managed to escape but still can't avoid being chased by zombies, who mistaking him for a sexy lady. He dashes into the restroom and encounters an innocent bystander in a wheelchair. Desperately seeking a chance to survive, he heartlessly pushes the wheelchair into the warm arms of the zombies for tongue massages and hides in a stall, saving his own life. The hostess was furiously coming out to demand an explanation for the sudden interruption of her show when a zombie burst onto the scene, claiming it could have a zombie baby with her. Terrified to wet herself, the hostess didn't even have time to run for her sexy life before she became zombie fodder. Meanwhile, Nina and another girl were in the office waiting for her boyfriend to return. He did come back, but something was off. The girl standing in front of them got bitten first. Realizing something was wrong, Nina quickly ran into a nearby cubicle and barricaded the door, narrowly escaping the same fate. Her attempts to call for help were futile, and when she tried to shout out the window, she saw it was swarming with zombies. Fortunately, the television was still broadcasting, informing that the country had entered an emergency state and was attempting to eliminate the zombies. They advised people to stay calm and run if they encountered any zombies. Then the signal suddenly cut off. Nina, refusing to believe the zombie outbreak was real, sat down and wept like a giant baby. The following morning, Olympus was in disarray. The actors playing the gods safe in their cubicle had no clue about the zombie crisis outside. They gathered for breakfast, wondering why their boss hadn't called them to start working yet. Ignorance truly was bliss. When Nina woke up, she felt that hiding wasn't going to solve anything. She looked at the zombies outside the window, grabbed a pair of scissors, and charged out. Little did she know she'd run straight into her boyfriend. As he looked into the eyes of his girlfriend, he lunged at Nina, aiming for a loving zombie kiss. Without hormone mercy, Nina stabbed him with the scissors, executing a successful counterattack. She then took her boyfriend's car keys. With her newfound experience, Nina cautiously stuck to the walls but was still spotted by a zombie who detected her hormone smell. She took off running and successfully shook off the zombies. Once outside, Nina saw zombies wandering all around and had to move like a statue, inching slowly towards the car. But as soon as she opened the car door, she startled the nearby zombies. A horde of zombies chased her after her smell, but fortunately, Nina made it to a safety zone. With the iron door shut, she was completely isolated from the zombies. Nina wandered aimlessly down the corridor, unsure of where to go. After another close encounter with a zombie, she opened a door and successfully hid inside. To her surprise, she found herself in the Temple of the Gods, where the actors playing the deities greeted her with applause, mistaking her blood-covered self for a new member of the divine cast brought in by the production team. Nina informed everyone that zombies had surrounded the place, but her warning was brushed off as a prank. Too frustrated to explain further, she headed straight for the window to check the outside situation, only to find that it was one-way glass. She couldn't see out, but the zombies outside could see in, peeping at her intently. The other acting gods, thinking it was time to start work, cheered excitedly. Nina couldn't stand it. She yelled at them to wake up since the show was over. But no one believed her smelly bullshit. They were all too immersed in their roles, not thinking like normal people. In tears, Nina shared her harrowing experience, but a god-playing man in blue thought she was out of her mind and complained to the camera about why the production team sent a silly girl. This infuriated Nina, who again yelled about the zombies outside, challenging anyone who wasn't afraid of death to go out. Everyone was stunned, except for a tattooed guy who thought he was possessed by a real god and insisted on opening the door to check. Nina was near breaking point. She threatened Tattoo Guy with scissors to close the door, but after closing it, he felt embarrassed and opened it again while she was unprepared. As soon as the door swung open, the zombies that had been waiting outside rushed in and tackled Tattoo Guy, ready to bite his tattooed muscles. Everyone else ran in panic. Just as Tattoo Guy was about to be bitten, a nanny accidentally offered her leg to the zombies, who would like to be babysitted and would not refuse a meal served on a platter. She was bitten. A mustached man named TK hurried over and tried to kick the zombie off, but the zombie wouldn't let go of Tattoo Guy. In the end, it was Nina with a fire extinguisher who brought the zombie down, smashing its head to onion pieces with several clangs. The gory scene nearly made everyone vomit. To convince everyone that this wasn't just special effects, Nina led them up to the parapet. As they watched zombies munching on limbs and flesh, the gods finally believed and accepted their fear. The scene shifts to Anna's room. After a good night's sleep, aided by sleeping pills, she wakes up to a shocking discovery. Her home looks like a crime scene, and her son Leo is covered in blood, sitting on the sofa in a daze. 
Anna quickly approaches to ask what happened, and Leo can only lead her to the door to show her his zombified girlfriend who has been locked inside. It turns out that the girlfriend was bitten by a zombie while they were out to see a movie, and Leo managed to bring his mutated girlfriend back home, ready to keep her a zombie pet. Leo believes their home is no longer safe and suggests seeking refuge on Olympus, where Anna was once the chief producer, until for some reason she was suddenly fired by Brandau, probably not for anything good. Anna flatly refuses. Meanwhile, Brandau, who has been hiding in a bathroom stall, hears silence outside and decides to venture out. He doesn't get far before he finds the show's hostess lying on the floor. When he calls out to her, she lunges at him with claws bared, forcing Brandau to run for his shitty life. Luckily, he runs into a room and is saved once more. Unexpectedly, there's someone in the room. It's the goddess-playing actress who was previously eliminated from the show. Her chicken screams of terror attract the zombies outside, causing a headache for Brandau, who quickly tells her to shut up her smelly mouth. They hide behind a sofa while the zombies pound on the door. After some searching, Brandau finds a cell phone in his bag. On Nina's end, everyone is mourning the bitten nanny, but Nina knows she's likely to turn soon. She grabs a fire extinguisher, intending to smash the nanny's head, but TK stops her, urging her not to be so violent. After much persuasion, Nina calms down. Back to Anna, annoyed by the constant banging and howling of the zombified girlfriend, she finds herself unable to sleep due to the lack of rest. In her idleness, she starts exchanging insults with the zombie through the door, even smashing the door to express her displeasure. In the heat of the moment, she accidentally breaks the door, and the zombified girlfriend charges out, tackling her and ready to bite. In this critical moment, Leo is awakened by the chicken noise and sees his chicken mother in danger. He quickly covers the zombie's head with a bedsheet, intending to play hide-and-seek with her. Unfortunately, Leo is no fighter, and after a struggle, he is overpowered by his zombified girlfriend. He has no choice but to take his mother and hide in the room, leaving the zombie howling outside. Now Anna can't complain about the zombie noise anymore, thinking that it sounded better than her chicken noise. The next day, all of Brazil was thrown into chaos with zombies swarming the streets and not a single pedestrian in sight. Anna and Leo decided to make a break for Olympus to survive. Meanwhile, Nina and the others, faced with the nanny on the brink of turning into a zombie, decided to risk it all. Taking TK and Tattoo Guy, they set out to find medicine at a pharmacy, but the area was already overrun with zombies. Thinking of leaving was pure fantasy. Cornered on top of a wall, they wondered if this was the end for them. They thought even those who've played gods must have some tricks up their sleeve. TK, cursing their cruel fate, banged on the wall, unwittingly attracting zombies. The horde eagerly gathered below. Seizing the moment, they came up with a plan and called everyone to make noise with gongs, drums, singing, and TikTok dancing. The strategy worked, drawing a large number of zombies to watch. Nina and the others took the chance to escape to the back door. As they were about to get into the car, the assistant zombie from the group spotted them, excited to see familiar faces. It charged at them, followed by the rest of the zombies. TK ran for his mustached life, with Nina and Tattoo Guy scrambling into the car. With no other choice, Tattoo Guy drove off as TK chased after them, setting a record speed of 3 seconds for 50 meters. TK managed to jump into the car ahead, and they narrowly escaped. The three of them then set off to find supplies, driving to a supermarket. Before getting out, Nina sternly reminded Tattoo Guy to stay in the car and not to flex his tattoo in this zombie apocalypse. Assured he would stay put, she and TK went into the supermarket to gather needed items. The scene shifts to Brandau, who is fast asleep like a pig despite the zombies howling outside, oblivious to the commotion. The girl next to him is driven to the brink of madness by the combination of the zombies' howls and Brandau's piggy snoring. Unable to bear it any longer, she throws a book at his pig nose. The camera then cuts back to Leo. Leo and his mother were driving to Olympus when they were blocked by several old cars. He had to get out and move the cars manually. He cautiously pushed the cars, but the noise attracted a zombie. It lunged at Leo, ready to bite to taste his juicy muscle. Startled, Leo jumped back into the car, fighting off the zombie's attack. Seeing her son in danger, the mother quickly started the car and floored the accelerator, hitting the zombie and sending it flying like a Barbie toy. The loud crash drew the attention of a horde of zombies. Leo quickly cleared the last car and got back into their vehicle, hoping it would be zombie-proof. As they shut the door, a mass of zombies arrived, slamming against it. The car wasn't built for such abuse, and a few more hits would break it down. 
Anna pressed hard on the gas pedal and they sped away, with the zombies still in pursuit. Turning to Nina, she and TK made their way to the pharmacy section of the supermarket. Since money was no object, they packed up all the medicines they might need. Their appetites getting the better of them, they then ventured to the pizza section and loaded a cart with every flavor of pizza available, not even sparing those in storage. While the two shopped to their heart's content, Tattoo Guy outside was dying of boredom. He forgot Nina's strict instruction to stay in the car and decided to stretch his legs and flex his tattoo outside. Just as he was doing so, a police car stopped nearby. Tattoo Guy put on a big smile and moved to greet them. To his surprise, the two officers got out and seemed ready to confront the smiling man. They aimed their guns at Tattoo Guy, suspecting him of no good due to his imposing tattoos. Tattoo Guy insisted he was a good citizen and knelt down in submission. He then claimed he was an actor and suggested they use facial recognition to verify his identity. It turned out the cops were fans of the show he was in, and after a closer look, they recognized him as a performer from the Olympus show. Thanks to the successful face scan, Tattoo Guy not only got to stand up, but also gained two new fans. The three of them chatted and laughed, exchanging nonsense gossip rather than kisses. After a successful shopping spree, Nina and the others were ready to push their cart out when by accident they dropped a bottle of drink on the floor. The zombies inside the supermarket took this as a dinner bell and swarmed out. In a frantic escape, Nina and company abandoned the cart and ran out empty-handed. The two police officers outside, witnessing people fleeing the supermarket, inexplicably raised their guns and warned the zombies that they would shoot if they moved. This successfully attracted the zombies' attention. One of the zombies pounced on an officer, pinning him to the car, while the other officer shot the zombies attacking him. With a spectator's gaze, he watched his partner struggle with the zombie, only to act when the partner was bitten, shooting the zombie dead. But he didn't stop there. He immediately killed the now-infected partner with a headshot, suggesting deep-seated animosity between the two. It was clearly a personal vendetta. Then, turning his gaze to the injured TK, it seemed like he intended to kill again. TK quickly explained that his injury wasn't from a zombie bite, but from jumping out of the car earlier. However, the officer didn't believe him and was ready to shoot, possibly jealous of his iconic mustache. Nina picked up a gun from the ground and shot the officer in the arm, saving TK's mustached life. Gunshots and arguments were causing quite a disturbance, and zombies from all around were drawn to the noise. Nina and the others hurriedly got in the car, and before leaving, they didn't forget to take the gun from the officer. The lone officer, still warm on the ground, became fodder for the approaching horde of zombies. The trio managed to drive away, inwardly thanking the officer for the unexpected weapon donation. Inside the temple, the bitten nanny seemed on the verge of turning into a zombie. She struggled in agony as the curly-haired lady held her, constantly comforting her, saying that once they got the medicine, she would be jumping around again. But the nanny couldn't wait any longer. Her eyes closed, and she was almost out of breath. The curly-haired lady was deeply saddened. She remembered Nina's instructions. The moment the nanny died, she had to be killed immediately to prevent severe consequences. The girl holding scissors hesitated to take action. While she psyched herself up, the nanny completed her transformation into a zombie and lunged at her, wanting to babysit her. The curly-haired lady let out a scream of terror, which alerted the other two outside. They rushed to see what had happened and found the curly-haired lady staggering towards them, holding a bleeding wound. Tattoo Guy's girlfriend immediately went to help, but the now zombified nanny followed and tried to bite her. The girl struggled and called for the man in blue's help, but the selfish man quietly closed the door, intent on saving himself. Just as the girl was about to be bitten, the curly-haired lady, still with some sense left, helped fend off the attacker, flipping the zombie nanny into a water basin, saving the girl's life. Seeing the crisis outside averted, the man in blue finally opened the door and sauntered out. Tattoo Guy's girlfriend, crying a river, held the fallen curly-haired lady. Looking at her bleeding out, she was at a loss for what to do. She knew the curly-haired lady would turn into a curly-haired zombie, so she had no choice but to leave. As soon as she got up, the lady turned into a zombie, but still remained curly-haired. They hurried inside, blocking the door to keep the zombie out. Unfortunately, the door had no lock, and they could only hold it shut by hand. Seeing the man in blue struggling to hold the door, the girl decided to take matters into her own hands with a blanket, ready to face the zombie head on. She handed the man the scissors, instructing him to stab the zombie when the opportunity arose. 
But the man in blue confessed he couldn't do it, infuriating Tattoo Guy's girlfriend, who accused him of being a chicken man. Wounded in his masculine pride, the man finally found new resolve. He took the blanket and scissors, and they coordinated their efforts. The girl lured the zombie into the hall, and the man threw the blanket over it, knocking it to the ground. Then, with courage, the girl stabbed the zombie dead. Meanwhile, Nina and the others had returned by car. Just as they reached the gate, they saw zombies continuously pouring into the yard. Nina quickly called TK to help close the gate, but the noise also alerted a large horde of zombies. Just a second before the zombies attacked, Nina managed to lock the iron gate. Unfortunately, a zombie was hiding inside the yard, crazily attacking everyone. TK, unflinching with a gun in hand, protected Nina and shot the zombie. Then Tattoo Guy seamlessly backed up the car, knocking the zombie away. Nina and TK successfully got into the car and returned to the safety of the secret room. Upon entering, they saw the zombie nanny cheerfully gulping down water in the basin. Nina raised her gun and shot, sending the nanny to babysit Satan in hell. The group successfully regrouped. Although they didn't bring the medicine back, they did manage to bring back a gun. With superior equipment at hand, everyone headed to the wall. Tattoo Guy picked up the gun and started to show off, trying to impress his girlfriend. He fired off a few shots, using the zombies as target practice, and proudly flaunted his marksmanship. Meanwhile, Nina and TK were quietly kindling a spark of romance, chatting and laughing their hormones away, their affection quickly warming up. On one side, there was joy and harmony, but Brandau on the other side wasn't so fortunate. The constant howling of zombies outside was unsettling him. He dismantled a nearby table lamp, taking the lamp post as a weapon in hand, determined to pierce the zombies' heads. Then he grabbed a girl beside him and demonstrated his technique to her. Brandau signaled the girl to open the door to trap a zombie's head so he could easily dispatch it with a blow. As he counted down, the girl quickly opened the door, and as expected, zombies squeezed in. Brandau swung his stick, knocking the intruder to the ground. The girl used the door to trap the zombie while Brandau ferociously stabbed with the stick, the bloody scene terrifying the girl, making her scream like an old baby. On the other hand, Leo and his mother were having an unobstructed journey, feeling incredibly pleased. They were happily chatting when suddenly they saw a police car blocking the road ahead. Two police officers were holding guns, signaling them to pull over. This puzzled Leo and his mother. Upon closer inspection, they recognized the two officers as the ones bribed by the congressmen, who were supposed to escape to the airport. Leo and his mother had no choice but to get out of the car. One officer demanded a strip search, while the other started siphoning gasoline. Their police car had run out of fuel on the way, and in a rush to reach the airport, they resorted to highway robbery for fuel. It was sheer madness. Leo's car was drained of every last drop of fuel, leaving them completely stranded. The congressman didn't care about their plight, ready to leave them in the middle of nowhere. As the congressman and his man were about to drive off, Leo quickly shouted to them, saying he knew of an absolutely safe place. This statement successfully caught the congressman's interest. The scene switches back to Brandau. After killing the zombies, he and the girl left the room, moving forward cautiously. Unexpectedly, they turned a corner and ran into more zombies. In their frantic escape, they stumbled into the broadcast center and shut the door behind them. Brandau looked around and discovered that one of the surveillance monitors was still functioning. Meanwhile, Nina and the others were joyfully feasting in the safe room. Brandau was struggling for survival while his employees were living comfortably, which made him feel indignant. He turned on the broadcast system and ordered them to come to his rescue. Brandau also spotted the gun and reminded Tattoo Guy not to forget the gun for the rescue. However, Tattoo Guy just refused in front of the camera, making excuses that as a shooter, he could only do ranged damage and was not good in melee combat. Furious, Brandau decided to resort to underhanded tactics. He pressed a button that locked all the doors of the temple, turned on the sound system and lights, and cranked the volume to maximum, torturing everyone with the overwhelming noise. The girl went to stop him. TK, hearing the girl's voice, realized she was with the boss and became instantly jealous, as she was his fiancé. Nina was taken aback by the revelation that TK had a fiancé and felt a mix of emotions. Not wanting TK to get into trouble, she volunteered to go with him to check things out. So they both made their way carefully to the entrance of the broadcast center, raised their guns, and unleashed a barrage on the zombies, successfully taking them out. On the other hand, Leo, under the threat of a gun, couldn't heed his mom's objections and ended up revealing the location of Olympus. 
The congressman also learned that Anna was the former producer there, with thorough knowledge of the place and access to communication channels, which might help them contact external assistance. Calculating the benefits, the congressman decided to take both of them along. Leo was thrown into the trunk with a detainee named Teresa. The atmosphere on the road was awkward. Leo started a forced conversation with Teresa, asking her what she did to get caught. She disdainfully replied that she liked to take photos on a whim and accidentally captured a picture of the police officer's illegal activities leading to her arrest. She was meant to be silenced, but the congressman intervened, saying she should be kept around to possibly feed the zombies later. Hearing this, one could wonder if these people had any humanity left. The car continued on its way, filled with despicable characters. The area outside Olympus was swarming with zombies, a complete mess. Brandau, having been saved, looked down from atop the wall at the chaos below, both shocked and speechless. It was clear that this place was no longer safe and that they needed to escape as soon as possible. In the secure room, Brandau made a disgustingly vile suggestion, revealing the twisted nature of his psyche. He proposed dismembering the curly-haired lady's corpse and sending the man in blue out to lure the zombies away. This would distract the zombies from the door and allow him to drive away from Olympus. After sharing his plan, he picked up a knife and fork, ready to proceed. Although the others did not agree, they dared not stop him. After all, everyone had their own agendas and were desperate to leave. As dusk fell, more and more zombies gathered outside the temple. A baffling scene unfolded. TK was caught kissing Nina using his tongue, despite being engaged to another. Inside, Brandau continued his gruesome task, while TK's fiancé, unable to endure the horrific sight, stepped outside for some air. To her dismay, she caught TK in the act, feeling as if she'd been made a fool of, as if she were dead to him. Brandau gathered everyone together, ready to make a run for it. But no one wanted to join him. The number of zombies outside was overwhelming, and leaving now was akin to a suicide mission. At this moment, TK's fiancé stood up. Betrayed by TK, she felt like a third wheel and chose to leave with Brandau. TK hurriedly tried to stop Nina from babbling, pulling out a gun and threatening Brandau not to take a single step. However, they had underestimated Brandau's shamelessness. Seizing an unguarded moment, he knocked out TK and Tattoo Guy with a single punch. His explosive strength took everyone by surprise, including Nina who was too stunned to shoot. As Brandau pummeled TK, his fiancé, still harboring feelings, grabbed a stick and knocked Brandau unconscious. As the night progressed, the number of zombies outside the temple increased, their eerie howls putting the Iron Gate at risk of collapsing at any moment. It seemed the temple was no longer defensible. The group sat on the couch, discussing how to deal with Brandau. They all knew of his unscrupulous nature and that he could betray them at any moment. Such a person could not be left alive, for he would surely lead them to their demise. Eventually, they agreed not to be too cruel and decided to break Brandau's legs. But before they could carry out their plan, Brandau escaped from a hidden room and even managed to take a gun from the table. Thinking they were after his legs, he now aimed to take their lives with the gun pointed at them. It turns out the man in blue chose to side with his boss. He had secretly freed Brandau, and now he snatched the gun, feeling empowered with a weapon in hand. Brandau took the car keys from Nina and kidnapped her heavy body, declaring he needed an overweight driver. The others wanted to rescue her but were powerless against those with guns. They could only watch helplessly as Brandau and his accomplice left. Brandau led Nina and the man in blue through the yard to the Iron Gate, which was already besieged by thousands of zombies. Fearing Brandau would open the gate, TK and the others ran to stop him. In the ensuing chaos, Brandau shot TK. Seizing the opportunity, Tattoo Guy knocked Brandau down and Nina was rescued. TK, who seemed unlikely to survive his gunshot wound, was resigned to his fate as he passed away in the arms of his fiance and Nina. The two girls wept bitterly like giant babies over TK's body, who had enjoyed a brief moment of bliss before his end and now could rest in peace. Meanwhile, the man in blue was still by the gate, feeding the zombies flesh, thinking it would make them leave. However, the scent of blood only incited the zombies to bang against the gate with even greater force. Nina, who had lost two boyfriends in a short while, couldn't swallow her anger. She picked up a handgun from the ground and fired at the zombies, but a handgun holds only so many bullets. In no time at all, the overwhelmed gate crumbled under the force of the zombie horde. The zombies swarmed in, fiercely attacking everyone inside. The man in blue, being closest to the gate, was devoured whole, including his smelly part. 
Nina, heartbroken by TK's death and having no will to live, told the attacking zombies she was tired and they could do as they pleased. Just as she was prepared to face her end, Tattoo Guy's girlfriend broke free from her boyfriend's grasp and pulled Nina away before they both ran for their lives with a horde of zombies in hot pursuit. Brandau, witnessing the horrific scene, had no choice but to run for his life as well. At that moment, the congressman and others coincidentally arrived outside the temple. To their surprise, the supposed safe haven had been overrun by zombies. The courtyard was full of crazed zombies biting anyone they saw. In a dire situation, the congressman's car stalled. Elsewhere, Nina and the others hurried into the temple, while Brandau, who was slower, was devoured by the hungry zombies, reaping the consequences of his misdeeds. Nina and the others dared not stop. They rushed straight into the main hall. Together, they tied the door handles with rope, but the zombies outside were battering the door, which would eventually break under the assault. With no means of retreat, they faced becoming zombie fodder. Turning to TK's fiancé, she had escaped early, constantly chased by zombies. In her panic, she ended up running into the broadcast center. She screamed and locked the door, then saw Nina and the others trapped in the temple on the monitors. They were in a similar plight. She quickly pressed a button, and the rolling shutter door began to close, providing temporary safety for Nina and her companions. But the low growling of zombies could be heard from the side. Nina immediately looked towards the sound, which was getting closer. Tattoo Guy also went to investigate. Unexpectedly, the zombies pushed open a side door and a horde of them flooded in. In a blink of an eye, Tattoo Guy and his girlfriend were overwhelmed by the zombie crowd. Nina was also in grave danger. She hurriedly called for help through the camera. The girl immediately opened the oracle room, and just as the zombies were about to attack, Nina decisively crawled in, narrowly escaping death. Now, only Nina and the girl were left as survivors in the temple. Everyone else had met their end. Zombies surrounded the entire temple, making it seem impossible for the two to escape. Meanwhile, at the congressman's location, the car had stalled, and they were forced to stop outside the temple, surrounded by zombies. Trapped inside, they could only wait for death. The policeman decided not to give up without a fight, grabbed a submachine gun, and got out of the car. He fired wildly at the zombies, but he was outnumbered and quickly surrounded. Anna saw that the situation was dire and hurriedly got up to close the car door, but before she could shut it, a zombie lunged in and bit her arm. Chaos erupted inside the car, and the assistant screamed in terror. Inside the temple, Tattoo Guy and his girlfriend, the ill-fated couple, were being bitten by zombies, and no one could save them. Nina learned through their conversation that TK's fiancé had also been bitten and would soon turn. It seemed Nina was the only survivor left in the temple, so Nina made a bold decision to open the oracle room and fight the zombies on her own. As dawn broke after a long night, the temple was in ruins. Remarkably, the congressman and others huddled in the car had survived. Just when the zombies broke into the car, the terrified officer grabbed a gun and started firing wildly. Incredibly lucky, he killed all the zombies. Even more fortuitously, the zombies fell in front of the car door, effectively blocking it and allowing them to escape death by chance. While they had saved their lives for the moment, fierce zombies were outside, and those inside the car couldn't leave. The zombies occasionally knocked on the glass to taunt them, terrifying everyone inside. To bolster their courage, the people inside the car began to bicker, their argument growing more intense and drawing more zombies to them. Although Anna had been bitten, she had not yet turned. She had a sudden idea and pointed to a manhole cover in front, suggesting they could enter the basement through it, which was connected to the temple, promising safety. The officer quickly used the scope to check if the plan was feasible, though the distance was somewhat far, and the manhole cover was locked, raising doubts about their chances of getting there safely. Meanwhile, Teresa by their side seemed pensive, and from her disdainful look, it was evident she must be a hidden ace. Sure enough, she tapped on the front window, volunteering to take on the task of opening the manhole cover. To boost Teresa's combat effectiveness, the officer handed over his baton to her, while he himself followed with a submachine gun. It was a very generous move indeed. Teresa took out a few smoke grenades and threw them ahead. The zombies immediately followed into the smoke, which completely obscured their vision. The horde of zombies became lost in the smoke, and the few that remained were no match for Teresa's heavy body. With the baton, she took down the skinny zombies with ease, her fighting prowess leaving Leo absolutely stunned. As Teresa turned around, she was suddenly tackled to the ground by a muscular zombie, and they tumbled their muscles on the ground, but not in bed. The officer, gun at the ready, found it difficult to get a clear shot. 
Seeing the situation turn dire, Leo quickly threw a riot shield her way. Teresa flung the zombie off, picked up the shield, and just as a few more zombies approached, the officer fired several shots, taking them all down. Teresa quickly rushed to the manhole cover, but before she could open it, more zombies charged at her. The officer fired hastily, but the zombies were too fast and dodged his bullets, turning to pounce on Teresa. In a critical moment, Leo rushed in with an iron rod to save her. With the officer's help, Leo took down the last zombie, saving Teresa. Then together, they opened the manhole cover and began signaling everyone to get out of the car. While the zombies were still at bay, the group hurriedly crawled into the underground passage. They moved forward cautiously, and upon passing through a large door, Leo wanted to close it. Unexpectedly, a zombie burst out, and he tried to shut the door, trapping the zombie in the doorway. Just as the zombie was about to break through, Anna and the officer rushed over to help. Everyone pushed against the door, but the zombie's strength was too great, and the three of them were struggling to hold it back. Teresa made a decisive move, smashing the fire safety glass and grabbing an axe from inside. With a swing, she chopped off the zombie's flirting hand, and the door was finally shut. This sudden turn of events scared everyone, but the selfish assistant, seeing Teresa with an axe, feared retaliation and suggested disarming her. The others immediately disagreed because Teresa's combat ability was evident to all. With the axe, her fighting power was even more formidable. She was a great asset in killing zombies, and the axe could not be given to the assistant who probably couldn't even kill a chicken. After much discussion, the assistant finally dropped the issue. The group continued their journey and successfully arrived at the broadcast center. Opening the door cautiously, they saw TK's fiancé sitting motionless in her chair, her back turned to everyone, seemingly watching the monitors. Teresa and the others slowly approached her. Meanwhile, the overly cautious assistant, fearing some mishap, quietly closed the door and hid outside to watch what would happen. Unexpectedly, a legless zombie began crawling towards her. The assistant was terrified, standing against the wall, closing her eyes and silently reciting an invisibility spell. Unfortunately, the spell had no effect on zombies. Just as she was about to be bitten, the assistant kicked out with her high heels, crushing the zombie to death under her stinky feet. Inside the room, Teresa, holding an axe, approached the girl, only to find that she had turned into a zombie and was lunging at Leo. The innocent Leo was instantly tackled to the ground and could only struggle desperately with his riot shield. The others, including the congressman, held their guns but dared not shoot. Teresa swung her axe and saved Leo. The repeated scares had everyone's hearts racing. Anna, familiar with the broadcast center, felt as if she were back on home turf and began to strategize. She pressed a few buttons with ease, and the screens cleared up instantly. However, the scenes displayed were chilling, with every room crammed with zombies. There was no safe place left. The assistant, playing the wise after the event, lamented that they should have gone straight to the airport instead of this dreadful place, speculating that death might come faster here. But Anna disagreed, asserting that this was her domain, and that if they followed her lead, they would surely carve out a swath of safety. She sent out Leo and the officer, starting with the temple corridor. The noise of their knocking on the walls drew a few zombies. The officer shot one dead but was tackled by another before he could fire again. Seeing this on the monitors, Anna sent Teresa to assist. With her intervention, the zombies were quickly dispatched. After clearing the corridor, Anna began her masterful maneuver, pressing the music button to attract the zombies with sound. As the horde moved away, only two zombies remained inside, and Anna promptly locked the door. Teresa and the others then burst out and easily eliminated their foes. Using the same tactic, they continued to slay zombies effortlessly, as if slicing through butter. They set traps for the zombies, tripping them with ropes and swiftly finishing them off. The trio cut down any opposition, quickly reclaiming the temple. The assistant, admiring the beautiful temple, happily went to the restroom to apply makeup, believing that only the most beautiful look was befitting of herself in the temple. Suddenly in the mirror, she saw the reflection of Nina approaching. The zombified Nina slowly walked toward her, causing the assistant to scream in terror. Hearing the commotion, everyone burst through the door. Anna, recognizing Nina as an old acquaintance, quickly stopped everyone from shooting, insisting she wanted to reach out with love to bring her back. She extended her hand towards Nina, hoping to bring back her consciousness. But she overestimated herself. Nina did not understand and pounced on Anna, her jaws wide open to bite. Seeing this, Leo quickly struck Nina with his stick, sending her to bite Satan in hell. With Nina meeting her tragic end, Anna burst into tears, blaming herself for everyone's misfortune and left in sorrow. 
Everyone had settled down for the night, but Anna stood alone in the kitchen. With a liquefied gas torch in hand, she heated a fruit knife until the blade glowed red hot. Then, raising her arm that had been bitten by a zombie, she pressed the hot blade against the wound, cauterizing it amidst the sizzle of burning flesh. Somehow, she endured the pain without flinching. The next day, as Teresa walked into the broadcast center, she found Anna and the others with somber expressions. They were trying to call for help. Teresa sat down next to Leo and noticed he was fiddling with his smartphone. Surprised, she asked if the phone could be charged. Leo replied that it could, but there was no signal and making a call was out of the question. Teresa didn't seem to care. She took out her phone and started recording a video selfie. She vented to the camera, saying that after the virus outbreak, she ended up on Olympus trapped with a few idiots. She also shared her experiences fighting against the zombies. After some adjustments, Anna successfully activated the satellite system and urgently broadcasted a plea for help. Although she found several signals, all were rejected. It turned out that the virus had swept across the globe, and every country was too overwhelmed to assist. Even the United States, which they had hoped to rely on, was asking other countries for help, indicating the severity of the situation. With no hope for rescue, the group could only switch to survival mode. Zombies swarmed outside, threatening to break in at any moment. Inside the temple, supplies were running low, and everyone was aware that they couldn't defend Olympus with just their small group. Talk was cheap. Without a solution, it was better to just go to sleep. While the others rested, Anna took Teresa to the broadcast center alone. Anna had come to see Teresa as her successor, teaching her how to use the equipment. However, the exhausted Teresa wasn't very interested and preferred to make videos with her phone. Then, without consulting anyone, Anna shared the location of Olympus through a geotag. Teresa thought this was unwise. It didn't take long for the assistant to discover this and immediately reported it to the congressman, accusing Anna of being a traitor. Anna had to explain to everyone that, in these apocalyptic times, human resources were the most important. With enough fighting power, they could take on the zombies. She believed that by sharing the location of the temple, they could attract more survivors. With more people, they could work together to fight the zombies. As for the issue of supplies, expanding their territory would allow them to grow food. This proposal sparked a discussion among the group. Lacking better options, the congressman agreed to the plan, but he insisted that they assess the newcomers seeking refuge. Given the circumstances, they had to be wary of the types of people who might arrive. It was a matter of self-protection. Conveniently, there was an abandoned building across the street, previously used as employee dorms. Everyone would have to stay there first, and only after being vetted could they enter the temple. Before they proceed, some preparations are necessary. First, they need to install cameras and other equipment in the building for communication with survivors. The task was assigned to Teresa, with Leo and the officer in charge of execution. Before setting off, Teresa had a heart-to-heart -heart with Anna because she was the only one who knew about Anna's arm being bitten. Seeing Anna working hard every day, Teresa was deeply concerned about her health. Anna, on the other hand, insisted on keeping it a secret, fully aware of what kind of people the congressman and his men were. For her son's future, she had to pave the way for him. Then, she entrusted Leo to Teresa, feeling at ease only with the kind-hearted Teresa. Leo and the others arrived and the trio, armed and carrying equipment, made their way to the building through the basement. Despite wave after wave of zombies attacking them, Leo, no longer the weakling of the past, fought bravely with a shield in hand and a machete that felled zombies left and right. The addict officer was pushed against a wall by a zombie. Just as he was about to be bitten, Leo quickly picked up a rifle and killed the zombie. The officer was puzzled as to how Leo knew how to shoot, to which Leo explained he learned it from video games. It seemed Leo had a natural talent for combat. Together, their combat strength was off the charts, and with perfect teamwork, they easily eliminated the zombies and entered the building. Once inside, they began installing various devices. Anna, monitoring the situation through cameras, was startled when a zombie burst in and tackled Leo. As she watched her son in danger, she screamed from behind the screen. Fortunately, with the help of the officer and others, the zombie was quickly dealt with and Leo was unharmed. After the incident, they started to calibrate the equipment and prepared to return the way they came. Meanwhile, as an influential public figure, the congressman acted like a walking advertisement, leveraging his ability to entice people with an uplifting promotional video, telling any survivors to join them quickly because this is the only safe haven left. The message was so enticing it made people want to rush to Olympus, whether they were seeking refuge or a vacation. 
Soon after, before the group finished their dinner, three people arrived at the building across the way, a worker and a doctor couple. They expressed their desire to join through the camera. The worker said he could contribute with his construction skills, and the doctor couple offered to treat the injured. After hearing them out, the hospital deemed the doctor couple more useful and allowed them in first, while the worker was to be quarantined. The officer disagreed, arguing that the worker looked strong and would be useful in fighting zombies, while the doctor couple might not even be able to swat a fly. As the argument continued, Teresa led all three into the broadcasting center against orders. She had her own reasons, worried about Anna's worsening wound and thinking the doctor might be able to help. Thus, she took action first and sought forgiveness later. Now it was too late to blame her. They let the doctor examine Anna. Upon seeing her wound, the doctor declared it beyond help, effectively sentencing her to death. Although Anna was prepared for this, it was still heartbreaking to hear. Unbeknownst to them, this man was just a charlatan posing as a doctor, looking for a free ride. Everyone believed his lies, and Anna's bite became common knowledge. The officer immediately drew his gun to kill the imposter, but Leo intervened. The congressman then suggested isolating Anna. Leo supported his mother, walking with her and the congressman into a room. The doctor's wife thought she knew the rules of this post-apocalyptic world and insisted on killing Anna. The volatile officer demanded everyone strip to check for wounds, allowing no hiding of injuries. Inside the room, the congressman sent Leo out, subtly threatening Anna with her son's life before leaving them alone. The mother and son had their final heart-to-heart -heart talk. Eventually, Anna made a tough decision. Since her days were numbered anyway, she chose to help everyone one last time, trading her life for their safety. Leo, though reluctant to let go, respected his mother's choice. He stood by his mother on the wall as the others formed a squad, ready to take on the zombies in a tough battle. As the gates rose, the zombies outside rushed over in a frenzy, but were stopped by the glass doors. Then, Anna, scared yet determined, climbed down the wall. She took one last look at her son on the wall, held back her sadness, and shouted to draw the zombies' attention. A horde of zombies swarmed toward her. She ran outward, leading all the zombies away. Surrounded by countless zombies, Anna was resolute to play her role. Standing on the wall, Leo aimed his gun, looking at his mother as she expressed her final act of love. Just as Anna was about to be torn apart by the zombies, Leo pulled the trigger, the bullet passing through his mother's skull to end her suffering prematurely. Her body fell to the ground and was devoured by the zombies, a cruel scene too much for Leo to bear. Because most of the zombies had been lured away, only a few isolated ones were left in the yard. The doctor's wife slowly opened the glass door and the squad rushed out. They fought the advancing zombies with solemn determination. Leo, having just experienced the pain of losing his mother, transformed his grief into hatred. With rage in his heart, he furiously killed the zombies as if avenging Anna. The others were not to be outdone, slaying zombies as if chopping vegetables. The newly joined doctor, indeed a poor fighter, was quickly overpowered by the zombies and cried out in terror. Hearing the cries, the officer quickly came to his aid and dispatched the zombies, saving the fake doctor. The intensity of the battle, even through the surveillance screens, greatly shocked the congressman and his assistant. Ultimately, with everyone's mutual help and fighting side by side, all the zombies inside were cleared, avenging Anna. Everyone embraced, but without kisses, celebrating this hard-won victory. They then moved the dead zombies outside and set them on fire, burning them to ashes, and also cleaned the ground, preparing as if for a grand feast. While everyone was busy cleaning up, the congressman approached them like a king meeting his subjects, first giving a thank you speech and expressing his sentiments. Then, as music started playing, the celebration began. People ate, drank, and partied, completely forgetting that their current safety was all thanks to Anna's sacrifice. Leo didn't join the party. At that moment, he was standing alone on the wall, looking at the distant flames, lost in thoughts of his mother. He regretted that his past preoccupations with romance had made him neglect his mother. Now that he had lost his only mother, the taste of pain and regret was all too real. As he was lost in his reverie, Teresa came to his side, comforting Leo and encouraging him to find his strength again. In an unexpected turn of events that evening, Teresa not only offered Leo emotional support, but also provided a different kind of comfort in the cover of night. The empty-hearted Leo accepted Teresa's body warmth, and they naturally fell into a hormone yoga session. While they were caught up in their passionate moment, the fake doctor, hiding in the shadows, witnessed everything and even took out his phone to record the scene. It was uncertain if their hormone yoga posts would be clearly captured in the dark night. 
After the celebration, everyone went to sleep. Teresa was alone in the kitchen, drinking water, when the doctor approached her. He showed her the recording he had made, revealing his unscrupulous nature when confronted by Teresa. Using the video as leverage, he attempted to coerce her into letting him play the lead role in his own fantasy. It was a disgraceful display of lust after a satisfying meal in the midst of the apocalypse. Also, this doctor dared to act indecently right under his wife's watchful eye. Teresa flatly refused. The doctor, driven to madness by his hormone desires, pulled out a knife and threatened to kill Leo if she didn't comply. Just as she was about to be forced, the officer arrived in time and shot the doctor from behind, saving Teresa. Leo rushed over as well, but in a surprising twist, Teresa began to accuse the officer of unjustly taking a life. The officer was unhappy with the turn of events. After all, he had intended to help, not to be accused of murder. He argued that a beast like the doctor didn't deserve to live. Survival was tough enough in this post-apocalyptic world without being burdened by misguided mercy. The argument escalated, nearly coming to blows. Meanwhile, the congressman had been watching everything through the surveillance system. He smirked devilishly, amused by the drama unfolding. After having his fill of the spectacle, he lazily turned on the microphone to interrupt the squabble, announcing that new survivors had arrived for an interview. It turned out that several people from the building across the street were clamoring to join their shelter. The argument ceased, and everyone quickly gathered in the broadcast center. The surveillance showed five individuals, one of them waving a gun at the camera. To prevent another degenerate from entering their ranks, the congressman suggested giving these newcomers a test to reveal their true selves and to examine their humanity. Only those who passed the test would be deemed worthy of joining the team. He dispatched the officer to the building, disarmed all the newcomers, and led them to the temple. Four men and an elderly lady were thus brought in. Seeing the doctor's body, they were all visibly unsettled, unsure of what they were about to face. But before they could worry further, they were treated to a meal. Once everything was set up, the congressman began posing questions to everyone via video. Unexpectedly, he demanded that the five newcomers vote among themselves to select one individual to leave Olympus. Whoever was chosen to leave would fail the test, while the remaining ones would be considered worthy of joining his team. As soon as he announced this, everyone was stunned. Leaving Olympus alone at that time was tantamount to delivering a midnight snack to the zombies. While the survivors were casting their final votes, Teresa arrived on the scene to halt this inhumane voting process. She informed the group that the temple's supplies were nearly depleted, and the congressman's call for them to come was simply to use them as free zombie exterminators. Rather than being pawns in someone else's game, she urged everyone to resist the congressman. Perhaps they could even carve out a chance of survival for themselves. Her words seemed to sway the crowd. Soon, the congressman realized he was losing control of the situation. He rushed to the scene and with a silver tongue managed to rally the scattered morale back to his side. He looked smugly at Teresa. The situation reached a stalemate. At this point, the officer couldn't sit by any longer. He grabbed a zombie from outside and threw it into the crowd, declaring that the zombie would make the decision for them while he observed everyone's reactions. Suddenly, the zombie lunged at the elderly lady, but just at the critical moment, the officer shot and killed the zombie. The bloody scene effectively intimidated everyone. Seizing the moment while the crowd was still in shock, the officer singled out a man from among the survivors. He was chosen because he had used the elderly lady as a human shield when the zombie attacked. The officer pointed his gun at the man and forced him to walk out into the yard, teeming with zombies. The rest of the group hurriedly grabbed their guns to intervene. In an instant, the man was bitten to death by the horde. Witnessing this horrific event, the people were terrified to the core and dared not utter another word, fearing that the tyrant in front of them might feed them to the zombies next. The officer, with his brute force approach, had successfully resolved a dispute. It was clear that in this apocalyptic world, having a silver tongue was useless. Strong force was everything. The officer acted as though he had an ace up his sleeve. Seizing the moment when most of the zombies were preoccupied with devouring their takeout, he led the survivors in a cleanup of the lone zombies outside the compound. By taking out these zombies, their safe zone could be expanded once more. Indeed, there's strength in numbers. 
The group worked together, each person with their assigned task, and it wasn't long before they had cleared out all of the zombies. However, during this time, a few survivors were caught and killed by the zombies. Competing for territory with zombies meant that casualties were inevitable. But even after clearing out the zombies, their mission was far from complete. An even more challenging task awaited them. They were sent to repair the iron gate that had been knocked down by the zombies. Leo, along with Teresa and others, braved the danger to close the gate. But upon closer inspection, they found that the lock on the gate had been damaged beyond repair. In an effort to fix the gate, Teresa and the others held the doorframe with all their might, while Leo tried desperately outside to secure the gate with ropes to keep it in place. But before they could tie the ropes tight, a swarm of zombies rushed in from the side. Leo was overwhelmed by the zombies. Faced with the overwhelming horde, the survivors had no choice but to retreat. They ran back into the temple, their operation a crushing defeat. The gate they had failed to secure was pushed down again by the zombies, and countless more poured into the yard, quickly overtaking the area. Leo's whereabouts were unknown, and his chances of survival were slim to none. Teresa stood atop the wall, looking at the place where Leo had vanished, tears streaming down her face in anguish. But there was no time for sorrow. They soon received a new signal. The surveillance showed that a large group of survivors had arrived in the building opposite, far outnumbering those in the temple. And it got worse. Before long, another group appeared, fully armed and looking like mercenaries, each wielding sophisticated weaponry and not to be trifled with. The mercenary leader shouted at the camera, boasting of their manpower and guns, and even bragging about their good looks. They claimed to be the rightful owners of the temple, and advised those inside to come out and welcome them quickly, or cede the temple to them. Otherwise, they threatened to execute one person every 15 minutes as punishment. Then the leader turned and pulled someone from behind him. To the astonishment of the congressman and others, the hostage in the camera's view turned out to be Leo. It seemed he had a stroke of luck after all, having been rescued from the jaws of the zombies by these mercenaries. However, just as Leo had narrowly escaped death by zombies, he was now on the brink of being killed by another's gun. Seeing her beloved in danger, Teresa became agitated. Ignoring everyone's advice, she was determined to rush over and save him. But as she made her way to the basement, she was stopped by the pursuing officer. Facing a distraught Teresa, the officer began to reason with her. They had fought side by side many times and had developed a deep comradeship. They trusted each other implicitly. The officer urged Teresa not to act on impulse. Going in alone would only waste a bullet from the enemy's gun and wouldn't save Leo. They would both end up as a tragic pair of star-crossed lovers. After calming down, Teresa finally took in what he was saying. She abandoned the idea of going alone and decided to join forces with the officer to confront the congressman. Only by dealing with the congressman could they hope to save Leo successfully. Unexpectedly, the two of them hadn't struck the first blow. It was the congressman who made the first move. Through the screen, he proposed a collaboration to the mercenary leader and advised him not to kill indiscriminately. He pointed out that each person killed was a loss to their fighting force, and in this apocalyptic world, combat strength was paramount. Just then, the officer arrived at the broadcast center with a bound Teresa. However, the congressman and the mercenary leader's conversation had ended before they entered. Seeing that the call had ended, the officer quickly suggested that the leader come to negotiate in person with a few of his men. Then, they could seize the opportunity to catch them all in one fell swoop. The congressman agreed and promptly extended the invitation to the leader, who accepted immediately. Strutting into the sanctuary with three henchmen and Leo as a hostage, the mercenary leader entered the temple. Leo and Teresa reunited. The congressman poured a drink for his opponent and initiated negotiations over the dinner table, discussing post-alliance asset distribution, the division of women, and strategies for dealing with zombies. While they were casually talking, a huge change took place in the building across from them. The glass was easily shattered by the pressing horde of zombies. Swarms of them flooded in, savagely biting at the people inside. Chaos ensued as everyone frantically tried to escape. Meanwhile, the mercenary leader was still talking nonsense with the congressman, who was an expert at negotiation. But in the midst of confusing his opponent, the congressman suddenly drew a gun and aimed it at the leader's head. Seeing their boss threatened, the three henchmen didn't dare to act rashly and were forced to lay down their weapons. Everyone breathed a sigh of relief as the situation seemed under control. But before they could fully relax, the congressman shockingly turned traitor, and with a sudden shift of his hand, he shot the officer in the head. 
This unexpected betrayal stunned everyone. Then, acting against all norms, he surrendered to the mercenary leader with his gun, proclaiming that from now on he would follow him, offering the slain officer as his pledge of loyalty. The congressman promised that the resources and women in the temple were theirs for the taking. Hearing this, the leader was invigorated. He stood, approached the doctor's wife and grabbed her hair, intending to assault her. In the nick of time, a man with glasses, armed with a rifle, arrived and shot one of the henchmen. While everyone was still in shock, Leo, who had been stealthily untied by Teresa, suddenly fought back, tackling another henchman. In the ensuing struggle, the henchman's gun went off and the bullet struck the innocent Teresa. After killing the henchman, Leo rushed to check on Teresa, who had taken a bullet and was in a critical condition. The elderly lady attempted to end the leader's life from behind. However, due to her old age and lack of strength, her knife only drew some blood without causing a fatal wound. Enraged and clutching his wound, the leader retaliated and swiftly killed the elderly lady. The leader quickly regained control of the situation. As the lives of those present hung by a thread, survivors from the building across the way who had found a basement during their escape now ran towards the temple. The leader shot the first person who entered, but as more and more people broke in, followed by a massive horde of zombies, the leader and his men were forced to shoot at the undead. But there were too many to kill, and the zombies launched a devastating attack on the people inside the temple. The congressman was caught off guard and was tackled to the ground and bitten on the arm. Even though he managed to shoot and kill his attacker, he now faced the prospect of turning into a zombie himself, with death not far off. Desperate, he made his way to the broadcast center, where he encountered the doctor's wife. To avoid mutation, the congressman asked her to amputate his bitten arm. But the delicate woman couldn't bring herself to do such a bloody deed and refused to act. Just when the congressman was about to threaten her with a gun, his assistant appeared behind him. Known for her ruthlessness, she decisively killed the congressman. To ensure he was truly dead, she took the gun and shot him in the head. He never would have imagined dying at the hands of his most trusted assistant, not understanding why she turned on him. It all traced back to when he had told the leader that the women in the temple were at their disposal. The assistant had seen right through the congressman's facade then. Already selfish, he would never willingly become a mere plaything. Thus, she harbored the intent to kill her boss, but lacked the opportunity until now. Unfortunately, though she succeeded in killing the congressman, she was bitten by a zombie during her escape. The woman looked at her, seeing a reflection of her own impending doom. Convinced she couldn't escape, she implored the assistant to bite her as well. She figured it was better to die by a compatriot's hand than to be torn apart by zombies. A beautiful woman biting someone was a much more pleasing sight than a zombie's attack after all. Elsewhere, the wounded Teresa informed Leo that his mother had told her about a secret room outside where they could hide. It seemed Anna had considered Teresa one of her own, even though her son Leo wasn't privy to this secret. Supporting Teresa, they made their way to the courtyard. While clutching her wound with one hand, she felt along the wall with the other and removed a panel, revealing a hidden button that controlled the temple's main gate. She placed her cell phone next to the button and exchanged a meaningful look with him. With his affirmation, she calmly pressed the button, opening the temple gates. Because of this, a relentless horde of zombies flooded into the temple. Inside, survivors met their fates either through death or injury as another wave of zombies swarmed over them. Meanwhile, Leo and Teresa had vanished, leaving behind only a blood-stained marker and a cell phone with no signal that kept displaying an incoming call. Except for the fate of Teresa and Leo, the rest were essentially wiped out, bringing the drama to its close. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.